All right, that's where we're going to be this morning, Psalm 3. I invite you to turn there with me in your Bible or on your Bible app so you can follow along. Before we start, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today and for your goodness and your faithfulness. It's good to sing about that, Lord, and remind ourselves of it and thank you for it. Our desire today, Lord, is to know you more and to understand more of what you have revealed from heaven for us so that we uh, could have lives that are full of your grace and, and in step with your leading. Help us, Lord, to see um, a personal and loving revelation of who you are in this text, Lord, that you've given to us. Help us to know more of your greatness and more of your attention for our lives and help us, Lord, to know how we can better represent you and give our lives to you as we follow after what you've revealed. We love you so much, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. On April 28th, 1789, Honorary midshipman Ned Young slept while mutineers took control of the HMS Bounty. The violence and the commotion roused every other sleeping sailor from their berth, but not Ned. He only woke up after the mutiny was all said and done. Now, seeing that the captain and his loyalists were adrift in the South Pacific, Ned soon announced that he fully supported the mutineers. I'll bet he did. They decided they would settle on a small island south of Tahiti since they couldn't return to England. Once there, conflict arose, and when a battle broke out between the mutineers and the locals, the Bounty Museum reports that Ned slept through that battle as well. (laughs) Something wrong with that guy. In Psalm 3, we find David asleep during a mutiny. Now, David was no narcoleptic midshipman. He was a seasoned warrior and shepherd. He knew tactics, he knew battle, and he knew the danger that he was in. The mutiny was against him after all. His night of sleep that we read about was not accidental or coincidental. David slept because in the midst of the worst crisis of his life, he was able to draw upon the spiritual rest provided by a loving God. Now, Psalm 3 is actually a really great psalm for the new year because it's a prayer given uh, from a person who is facing an uncertain future. And all of us are facing an uncertain future in, uh, because we don't know what's going to happen today or tomorrow or the next. We have some ideas and we have some hopes, but end of the day, we aren't sure what's going to happen. And not only that, many scholars consider Psalms 1 and 2 to be introductory to the Psalter. One commentator explains that Psalm 1 and 2 provide the theological undergirding for the rest of the songs that follow, making Psalm 3 sort of the first official psalm. Because after showing us the way of the righteous in Psalm 1, and then showing us the dominion of the Messiah in Psalm 2, we finally get to Psalm 3, and that's the first psalm that's actually called a psalm, and it's the first song that is from man's perspective to God. It's a prayer being sung out loud as an act of faith. So a great uh, introduction to 2023. In this short prayer, David gets right to the point and he says, Lord, I need help. Now we know why he's saying this because this is the first Psalm that also has a historical marker attached to it. We're told that David wrote this song when he fled from his son, Absalom. You can read about that starting in 2 Samuel 15. This mutiny, which happened in the later part of David's reign was sudden and widespread and serious. David had to quickly run for his life with no provisions, no plan, and no safe haven in mind to head to. Absalom's intent was not just to take the throne, but it was to kill his father. In that context, David produced Psalm 3. But what's remarkable is that the song isn't just about asking for help. That's what we would expect. David is in real, real trouble, doesn't know what's going to happen. It's the worst crisis of his rule. And so, of course, we would expect him to be asking for help, but that's not what this song is primarily about. After the ask, David then writes line after line with absolute confidence that God knows, God hears, God will answer with all the help that was needed, even though he had no idea what form that would take. David was so confident that he decided to make camp, bed down, and get a good night's rest, even though he was running for his life. That's how much he trusted the Lord. 
One scholar noted that David's declaration of, this, uh, of trust in this psalm is twice as long as his cry for help. This morning, there is a wide range of circumstances represented among us, no doubt. Some of you are in a period of abundance and enjoyment and ease. Some of you are in some sense running for your lives. Some disease is after you. Some uncertainty looms over your future. No matter where you find yourself on that spectrum, Psalm 3 is for all of us because all of us need help from the Lord We all want the strength and the rest and the hope demonstrated by David in these words. None of us know what's coming down the road, not for sure. And remember that these words were inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, delivered through his servants, recorded and preserved and delivered to you because God knows that we need these songs. We need these passages. These are the songs and prayers the Lord has provided so that we can sing and pray them back to him. So our text begins above verse one in what is called the title or the superscript. It says, a Psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Now, if you study the Psalms, you'll find that some academics discount the superscripts and say, oh, we just ignore those. You, we can't trust them. It says that David wrote that, but of course he did. And it says it was during this time of his life, but of course it wasn't. Uh, but to me, the, the issue is pretty simple. These titles are in the canonical text of the Hebrew Bible. More importantly, Jesus himself references one of these superscripts in Matthew 22, verse 45. So if they're good enough for Jesus, they're good enough for us. Now, right away, as we, as we see the setting here, it reminds us of an important truth that's very easy for us to forget. Every day, every season, every circumstance has a spiritual component. There's nothing that you can experience in life that is meant to be detached from your relationship with God and his intentions for your life. There's no experience that, that is just purely earthly or is, you know, purely physical. The Lord says, no, I wanna be involved in every single aspect of your life, every day of your life, uh, whether you're having a party in the palace or whether you're running for your life right? And not only that, not only is every aspect of our life connected to God's commands for us and his intentions for us, but we see here that no matter what's going on in your life, it's also a part of God's potential to use you. In this worst moment of David's professional life, in the most hectic crisis of his career, David was used by God to to produce something that would minister to millions of people for thousands of years, right? He's running for his life. And and in that chaos, in that crisis, the Lord whispers to his heart and says, hey, by the way, I want you to use this situation to to create a little song. And that song is going to be used to, to encourage and help and instruct countless millions of people in every place around the world for the rest of human history. Uh, What a beautiful thing. Verse one says, Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. It wasn't just Absalom that was the problem. He was the biggest problem, but uh, there was lots of enemies facing David. He had lost the nation. Their hearts belonged to Absalom, we're told. The army was with his son. Some of David's staff had switched sides. Other longtime haters came out of the woodwork against King David. Their attacks came in a variety of forms. Absalom's was the most direct, I'm going to kill you, right? That's a pretty direct attack. But then there was uh, all sorts of other layers of attack and layers of discouragement and problem. There was Ahithophel who had been a personal advisor, a really great personal advisor to David, but he switched sides. And he was now using his skill on behalf of the rebellion, trying to trap David. There was Shimei, He wasn't a conspirator, but he was a longtime hater of David. You see, Shimei was a Benjaminite, and he had hated David ever since David had replaced Saul, the Benjaminite, as king. And so uh, even though he wasn't a co-conspirator, he made it his business to harass and insult David as he left Jerusalem. He screamed curses and threw stones at the king and his family as they were going down the road. And then there was Ziba. This was a different kind of enemy, a different kind of attack. You see, Ziba pretended to be David's friend, but he was using the situation to better his own career by lying about what was really going on. He was pretending to help, but in reality, he was selfishly profiteering, using David's dilemma for his own personal gain. Under this immense strain, the first word out of David's lips is Yahweh. 
And in this psalm, he's going to call on that name six times in these eight verses, at least once in every section. He's calling on the name of the Lord. David knows exactly who he's praying to, exactly who he's calling to, exactly who he can send his petition to. David's desire was to be in the place that God, Yahweh, had called him to be, to be in his city, to be near the house of the Lord, to be in the position of service that God had anointed him for. And all of that had been disrupted in this moment of David's life. And so David comes to the Lord and he tells the Lord something that God already knows. He says, Lord, I'm surrounded by enemies. I'm being attacked. Well, of course, the Lord knew this. It can feel silly to pray to the Lord about things he's already aware of, but that's everything. God is all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. There's nothing that he doesn't know about. There's nothing that's news to him. And so we might think, well, then why pray? If I look at the Bible and see God knows, God is in charge. He knows all things. He knows everything that's going on. Before you know, time began and eternity passed, he saw my life. He numbered the hairs on my head. Well, then why pray about things he already knows about? Well, for one thing, we're commanded many, many times to, to, to pray. God says, hey, you need to pray. It's a command. And if our king asks us to do it, we need to do it. But as for the reasons why, there's lots of reasons why, and some of them are are, are here. Prayer is a tool that God has given us so that we can develop closeness with him. And not only develop a personal closeness, closeness with him as we communicate with him, but it also helps us to develop proper calibration for our human hearts. In prayer, we're able to remind ourselves of who God is. And we remind ourselves of what God does. We're reminded of what he has said in regard to our lives. Remind ourselves of what he has said his plans are for us. In prayer, we are able to verbalize and relinquish ourselves to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I'm giving myself to you. I'm giving my life to you. I'm inviting you to do what you want to do in my circumstances and in my experience. Prayer is one of the ways God gives us strength, according to Matthew 26. And prayer, very important, is a relational act. God is a person, a real person, and he actually desires close communicative friendship with you and with me. Uh, Many of you have longtime friends, but maybe you haven't talked to them for uh, a bunch of years. And yes, you're still friends, But all of you know that, would your friendship be enhanced, strengthened, maintained better through communication or worse through communication? It it would be enriched. It would be drawn together as you share your heart and they share their heart with you. And the Lord desires that kind of personal relational closeness with us. And so he says, hey, talk to me in prayer and let me strengthen you through prayer. And let me remind you about who I am and what I've done and what I say and what I want to do in your life through prayer. Let me develop closeness with you and develop this calibration in your heart as you pray to me. Verse two says, many say about me, there is no help for him in God, Selah. Not only were there actual physical attacks, there was also the head-shaking gossips around David throughout the nation, people who said he had it coming. They were saying that he had forfeited any right that he may have had to divine help after all he'd done. And you know what? Maybe they had a point. David's a big hero to us, right? We're so far removed and we see the whole story that it's very easy for us as students of the Bible and, and uh, you know, people in this day and age to overlook all the shortcomings that David had. But if you were one of David's peers, if you were a, a person of the tribe of Benjamin, if you had seen some of the things that David actually did, it might not have been quite so easy to overlook those things. David had lied and stolen. He became a, a, a land pirate for a while as in the land of the Philistines. He had abandoned Israel for a while to live with their enemies. He had cheated and murdered. He had allowed one of his own best friends to be slaughtered to cover up the affair he had with his wife. He broke the law in moving the Ark of the Covenant according to his own fashion instead of what the law required. Because of David, 85 priests and their families and their cities were butchered by Saul because they had given David a few loaves of bread. David had had some pretty big shortcomings. And so maybe he had it coming. And a bunch of people were saying, you forfeited the right for any kind of divine help. But God's help isn't reserved for those who deserve it. Thank goodness, because none of us are worthy of God's help. Hey, maybe you've never been responsible for the slaughter of 85 priests and their families. 
but you still don't deserve God's help. I don't deserve God's help. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all gone astray. None of us add anything to the glory or splendor of the Lord. None of us deserve his help. But God's grace is not about deserve. It's not about merit or payback or being good enough. In 1 John, we're told that it's because of God's great love for us that he helps us and brings us into his family. It's not because he owes it to us. It's not because we're worth it. He says, because I love you, I'm bringing you into my family. We don't earn it. We receive it as a free gift. John 1 verse 12 says this, to all who did receive him, Jesus Christ, he gave the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name. That's what makes you worthy of receiving God's help and God's grace, belief and coming and receiving the gift that God has given in Christ Jesus, his son. And so many said of David, God's not gonna take your calls. But we see throughout the Psalm, David didn't believe that. Rolf Jacobson writes this, the quotation of the enemy's speech in verse two establishes the central theological issue of this Psalm. Will God help the psalmist? It's a very important question for us to settle because we need to answer it for ourselves. Will God help me when I call out for help? David had that question settled in his heart. He knew that God would help him when he cried out. We're gonna see that unfold. Now, this verse here ends with that word selah that you see in the Psalms. We also see it used in the book of Habakkuk, but usually it's just in the Psalms and uh, it's used a lot. This is the first usage of it. What's up with that? The truth is scholars can't agree exactly on what it means. Uh, Most people think it had some sort of musical direction attached to it because, of course, the Psalms originally were prepared and used in the group worship in the tabernacle and the temple. They had musicians and choirs and things like that. And so they think that there was probably a musical direction attached to this word. A lot of people think it means something like make a crescendo with the instruments. We're not sure. Now, Bible scholar John Phillips suggests that the word may mean there, what do you think of that? And I like that because that may be a little bit more helpful thought because we are primarily readers of the Psalms rather than singers like in David's time, right? We do sing some of the Psalms, but we don't get together and use the Psalter as our songbook and we don't have the original melodies, those sorts of things. And so we're not exactly sure what it means, but it might mean there, what do you think of that? And anytime we come across a Selah, it can be a helpful thing as a reader to just pause and, and meditate on that stanza, meditate on that phrase and, and, and ask ourselves, ask our hearts, uh, invite the Lord to minister to us and say, what do I think of what was just said? What is true about what was just said? What does the Lord have to say about what was just said? So I, can, I think that can be sort of helpful. Verse three says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. David wasn't alone when he ran from Jerusalem. He had his mighty men with him. There were some soldiers and and family members with him. There were even 600 Philistines who came in support of him. But he recognized that none of those soldiers, none of his mighty men, none of his advisors around him, none of them were the answer that he really needed. None of them were his secret weapon. They weren't his shield, the Lord was. And he recognized that from the outset. And not just a little wooden shield that David would have to hold up under his own strength, blocking an arrow or two that might come from one particular direction. David thought about the Lord, realized the Lord was with him. And he said, man, Lord, you are a shield all around me, covering me on every single side. And I don't even have to hold you up under my own strength. David's words here are tender and moving. In the short term, David needed something like a shield, right? He was being attacked. He needed a shield so that he wasn't pierced by an arrow or by a sword. In in our day and age, we might say David needed a parachute real bad, right? He's in free fall. And if he doesn't have a parachute, he's going to splat on the ground. Uh, But he recognized that God was, was not only going to be there to deliver him from death, but that the Lord was so much more. This Hebrew word for shield has a whole bunch of derivatives. And one of them describes a mother hen putting her wings out over her chicks. 
Another one of those derivatives is actually the word used for garden, specifically the Garden of Eden. That special God-designed place, which was protected by a hedge all around, but it wasn't just a covering for Adam and Eve. It was a special place where God could commune with people and fill them with life and, and do all of this interaction with them. He says, man, Lord, you're like that kind of hedge, that kind of covering, that kind of garden where you're not just covering me from the blast. You're bringing me in to be a part of a special relationship with you where you give me not just protection, but a thriving and wonderful life. Next, David said, God isn't just my shield, he's my glory. Man, how was there glory in running for your life with your tail between your legs? How was there honor in this experience? But David says, the Lord is my glory. The Lord is my honor. There is splendor in my relationship with the Lord. You see, David reveals here that his self-worth wasn't tied to a palace. It wasn't tied to a throne. It wasn't tied to his royal robes or to the sword of Goliath. He says, yeah, I'm on the run for my life. I had to leave everything behind. I'm about a few steps from death, but the Lord is my splendor. The Lord is my reward. The Lord is my honor. And no one can take that kind of glory from me. And then he takes even another step into the tender kindness of God. And he says, Lord, you're not only my shield. You're not only my glory, my honor, my reward. You are the one who lifts up my head. You know, when we read in 2 Samuel about this story unfolding, we're told that as David fled the city, he went up the Mount of Olives. Yeah, that Mount of Olives. He went up the Mount of Olives barefoot and weeping for what was happening. David recognized, though, that the Lord was there with him in his suffering and not just beside him and not just giving him a hard, you know, stiff upper lip old chap. No, he, he was taking David's head in his hands and lifting it up in his sorrow and looking at him face to face to remind David, I'm with you and I love you and I haven't left you. The whole nation has abandoned you. You're being rejected. You're being hunted, but I'm with you and I love you and I'm going to surround you and I'm going to care for you and I'm going to watch over you. And what a wonderful reminder of our our Lord's own visit to the Mount of Olives where he went and suffered and wept so that you and I could be rescued from our enemies of sin and Satan and death and the grave. Oh man, what a great moment this was. Verse four, I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy mountain. There, what do you think of that? David's prayer was delivered out loud for everyone to hear. Of course, God could have heard it from the silence of his heart, but we remember that God's people are commanded to sing out loud. Colossians 3, Ephesians 5, it's not just in the Psalms that we're commanded to sing, though we are in the New Testament too. Singing our praises and our prayers out loud with one another is one of the best ways for us to make the most of these evil days. That's what the New Testament says. We're told that as we sing with and to one another these songs about the Lord, that we are spiritually enriched. It's an important thing for us to do this together. David cried aloud. He was not ashamed for anyone around him to know about his dependence on the Lord. He wasn't trying to act like, well, I'm the big, strong king. I can't let anyone see me, you know, worry. I can't let anyone see me, you know, vulnerable. He says, I know I want everybody to hear that I am dependent on the Lord, my God. He wasn't trying to hide his troubles. He wasn't trying to pretend like he could solve everything. In fact, the linguists tell us that this phrase could be translated, whenever I cry aloud, he answers me. This is how God consistently operates. We cry to him, he responds to us. Since he was faithful to David, we can be sure he will be faithful to us. Why? Because his faithful love endures forever. Not just for this man, but for all of his people. That's the conclusion David's gonna come to, that this is for all of his people. And that whenever we cry aloud, the Lord responds to us in love and grace and care and affection. Verse five says, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. So let's follow this. David's on the run for his life. He cries out for rescue. He says, I know the Lord is going to answer me, but then he doesn't wait for the response. We get no response from the Lord. He goes to bed. He says, all right, I cried out to the Lord. I know who the Lord is. I know he's gonna answer me. Time to go to sleep. I think that's pretty amazing. If someone broke into your house, 
Would you call 911 and say, I need some help. Somebody broke into my house and now I'm going back to bed and go back to bed? No, you wouldn't do that. That'd be crazy. That's not exactly what David's doing. I mean, he was running. He was putting distance between himself uh, and, and Jerusalem and, and, and these conspirators, these rebels. But after a little while here, he, he has this, this spiritual activity happening in his heart. And he says, you know what? It's time to go to bed. And he was traveling on foot with a pretty good group of people. He had family members. He had hundreds of people around him, right? This is a slow moving group. A, a, a band of warriors on horses would be able to overcome this group very quickly. And, and th- they didn't have time to go to sleep in one sense, but David says, no, we're going to sleep. I'm going to bed. I'm going to get a good night's rest. But we see the incredible peace and confidence that has flooded his heart. It reminds us of the time in the book of Acts when the angel finds Apostle Peter sleeping in his jail cell the night before he's supposed to be executed. These men, Peter and David, what can we make of that? Well, we see that they understood that life is not about our physical circumstances. It is about our communion with a loving God and that our God is the one who sustains his people. Now, in this case, what did God sustain David with? We, we didn't get an oracle from God. Uh, we didn't, you know, we're, we're not told that he received some kind of special provision or special weapon. No one brought David any Patriot missiles to be able to fire at Absalom. He wasn't granted access to any secret fortress that Absalom couldn't find. He didn't get anything tangible at this point. Instead of immediate tangible assistance, the Lord simply sustained David with hope. And hope was enough for him to say, all right, we're going to bed. I'm gonna get a good night's rest. The Lord's on the move. This summer when I had my stroke, there were two passages of scripture um, that the Lord sent us in sort of special ways that really ministered to us and really helped us when we didn't know what was gonna happen. The first was John eleven four. Uh, we were there in the emergency room and they were running all these tests and just told us, hey, yeah, you had a stroke, come back here, all those sorts of things. And that verse Jesus said of Lazarus, this sickness will not end in death. And oh man, we grabbed onto that and held on for, held on for dear life, we might say, but uh, really appreciated that. We, need, we were at a really low moment and, and we received that from the Lord. But the second was this Psalm, Psalm 3. Uh, night came, I had been admitted into the hospital, but it's COVID time, right? So they told Kelly, yeah, you can't stay. He's gonna have to be by himself all night. And so that brought us pretty low. And so she left and I was alone, wondering and worrying and frankly afraid to go to sleep and felt impressed to listen to this psalm. And even though at the time we had no medical fixes, no big answers to the big questions, uh, I felt like the Lord was just saying, you can go to sleep because here's my hope, here's my love for you, here's my word that was true for David and is true for all of my people. And so the Lord supported us that night with hope. Now, Absalom had every advantage. He had the numbers, he had the weapons, he had the popular opinion, he had better tactical positioning, he had all the things that you want in a fight like this. But the Lord doesn't need earthly power to sustain his people. David knew that, and so he got some rest. And as Christians, we are invited to enter into this kind of rest where we can look at the bleakest of circumstances and say, I'm gonna be beheaded tomorrow, it's time to get some sleep, time to get some shut-eye. Uh, it's funny, we, you know, we, you, you have the, those hypothetical questions. What would you do if you only had one day left to live? Peter's like, well, I would take a nap for one thing. <laughs> and then I'd wake up refreshed for my beheading, I guess. But man, this is the kind of rest that the Lord wants us to have as we walk through an uncertain world. Jesus said, come to me and I will give you rest. I'm gonna give it to you. But it's not always easy for us. We struggle with us. And so in the book of Hebrews, we're told to make every effort to enter into this rest as we walk with the Lord. And as we look at these examples, Peter and David and others in the scripture, we see that it is possible. It's not for a select few. It's God's gift for all of his people if we will do, uh, if we will believe what he has said. Verse six says, I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. David didn't have to be afraid because he had an all-powerful shield on every side. He was still in danger, but he knew the Lord was on the way. 
Imagine you were playing poker and your opponent showed his hand when it was time for the call, straight flush. I mean, that's the kind of hand that can clear the table. One in 72,000 are the odds in that. Uh, Man, you're in trouble, right? But if they show a straight flush while you're holding a royal flush, then it doesn't bother you at all. Their straight flush means nothing because they may have two, three, four, five, but you've got 10 jack, queen, king, ace, right? And so it means nothing to you. Their powerful hand has no chance against yours because you have the royal flush. On the spiritual level, we have been dealt a royal flush every single time. There is no better hand. God has dealt you his grace, his goodness, his truth, his attention, his affection. He's dealt you his gifts and a spiritual family and special opportunities to walk in. What is our part to do? Play the hand, right? Our part is to do what David did. What did David do in the Psalm? All he did was believe and rest. Now, he was doing, actually, this isn't a let go and let God message. That's not it. David was having conversations, making plans. He was walking down the road. Don't get me wrong. But but what settled the issue in his heart is that he, I believe God. And God hadn't even delivered him any specific prophecy of like, here's what's gonna happen to your son. David didn't know what was gonna happen, but he says, I believe God is good. And I believe God has called me to a certain life. And I believe God has a future for me. And because I believe him, I can rest, even though these are the worst circumstances of my life. We've been dealt a royal flush. Believe and rest and play the hand God has given you. Verse seven, rise up, Lord, save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Now, these sort of lyrics don't usually make their way into our modern worship songs. Every now and then, somebody on the worship team reminded me, we did used to sing this uh, psalm, uh, one of the old, old Calvary ones, but there are a variety of psalms that have this kind of language, which scholars call imprecatory prayer, uh, where it's praying for the, the judgment, the wrath against the hurt of the wicked. We know that David was a prophet and this was going to happen, but David wasn't in a vengeful or a violent mood. In fact, he showed almost unreasonable mercy to Shimei during this saga. And when it was time to finally fight, he told his soldiers very specifically, oh, don't hurt my son Absalom, treat him gently. Uh, Joab said, "Mm, I'm gonna go ahead and overthrow that memo and I'm just gonna stab this dude to death, which is what he did. But verses like these remind us that God is going to avenge. The Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He is going to bring a full and fierce judgment on his enemies, a wrath that cannot be escaped. And it reminds us that wickedness really does need to be restrained. David on one level is looking at this and saying, this is so wicked. This is so wrong. This is so destructive. Lord, put a stop to this wickedness. Job and the prophet Joel described the wicked as monsters with fangs and that breaking those fangs means that the innocent will not be devoured, but they will be delivered. And so they call out to the Lord and say, Lord, break the fangs of the wicked. Or or Job says, hey, did I not live a life where I broke the fangs of the wicked and saved people from destruction? I think part of the problem is we're so used to seeing injustice go unpunished that, and we're so used to the world calling evil good that we can be shocked when we see an expression of true justice, where it says, that's wicked, judge it, crush it, destroy it. Now, we are on the other side of the cross also. David did not have the full revelation of scripture, which we have. We understand um, all that Christ has done and all that Christ is going to do and that vengeance belongs to him. And so on this side of the cross, The the fact of the matter is the Absaloms and the Shimeis aren't actually our enemies. Satan is our enemy, not Shimei, right? And Christ has commanded us to pray for our human adversaries and our persecutors. We're to bless them, not to curse them. We're to understand that God loves those individuals just like he loves us. He wants to save those individuals from the wrath they deserve just like he has saved us. But God is a warrior And he is going to repay the wicked for all that they do if they will not repent and receive his salvation. It won't be a slap on the wrist. It will be crushing. It will be the everlasting death in the lake of fire. But God's hope, and therefore ours should be too, is that all of those enemies would repent and be saved rather than perish in their sin. Verse eight says, salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. What do you think of that? 
David started in crisis, he ends in complete confidence, not only for himself, but for all God's people. He says, hey, this is not just about me. This is for all of God's people. This is for all of the Israelites, all of the mixed multitude who had come in to believe alongside him and all who would follow after. He, he said, the Lord's salvation is for all of them or blessing is for all of them. And this would include, by the way, the many, many Israelites who were currently involved in the rebellion against him. That's how powerful God's intervention can be. That's how strong God's reversal of a heart can be. He can bring rebels back into the fold. Understand that some of the people who drew the sword for Absalom would later sing this song in the tabernacle, recognizing that God had not only helped David, he had helped them too bring them back from their sin, bring them back from their rebellion and restore them into the house of God and the people of God. You see, the help God offers is not just a payday loan. It's not just a Saturday night special. God is offering us salvation, right? That's what David says here. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. And it's interesting, the same word that is used for help in verse two is the word used for salvation here. In Hebrew, it's the same word. And David says, I need help, and that help is salvation, and salvation only belongs to the Lord. Only he can offer it. And what is his salvation? Well, this is one of those beautiful Bible moments because we discover that the word there in the Hebrew is Yeshua. That's what he was looking for, Yeshua. It's a noun and becomes a name. When you bring the Hebrew name into the Greek, it becomes Jesus. Jesus is God's salvation. The help you need isn't a sword, it's a savior. When we call out to God for help, God says, I'll help you and what I'm gonna help you with is Jesus. That's what I'm gonna give you. Jesus, our refuge, our stronghold. Jesus who gives us his strength and his comfort and his love. Jesus who gives us his mind and his heart. Jesus who changes every perspective and makes sense of every circumstance. Jesus who is the rock on which we build our lives. Jesus who loves us with an unfailing, loyal, kind and compassionate love. Jesus who speaks and it is done. Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus who has invited us to rule and reign with him. That's the help God dispatches for those who call out to him. And he's listening for your call even now. 